Good morning, students of physical science energy. I'm going to record a lecture today on forces. It is our forces unit. It is all about forces this week. Let me get on screen share here. And we're gonna present this. All right, here we go. So it's all about forces this week. Our essential question is, what are the underlying forces that cause or resist motion? There are four fundamental forces that exist in nature. Um, these are the four fundamental forces in order from strongest to weakest. So the first one we talk about is strong nuclear force. Okay, this is the force that holds the nucleus of the atom together. Um, right now in physical science pattern, we're talking about the atom. Most of you have already taken that class. So that is that force that holds the protons and the neutrons together in the um, nucleus of the atom. Um, the second strongest of the four fundamental forces that exist in nature um, is electromagnetic force. Um, it acts between positive and negative charges or poles. So they lump electrostatic and magnetic into one type of force um, because of its um, similar properties that way. Um, the third strongest is called weak nuclear force. And um, this is also a force that you probably um, have heard about in physical science matter. It causes some kind of radioactivity. It's responsible for making isotopes, elemental isotopes. Um, so those two, you, uh, number one and number three, you talk more about physical science matter. Um, we started with gravity um, last week, and that's the fourth of the um, four strongest fundamental forces. Um, it is the force that causes all masses to be attracted to each other. Um, last week, we also learned that your weight comes from the gravitational pull from the mass of the Earth on your body's mass. Um, so these four fundamental forces are really cool because they're responsible for all of the motion um, in between all objects in nature. Um, it's because of these four fundamental forces that things move or resist motion. And these are the, the four main ones that you need to know. Okay, um, you also can break this down um, more by how um, the forces interact, um, whether it's at a distance or in contact. That means in between the two objects. So some forces um, are at a distance forces. Those are gravity, magnetism, and electrostatic force. These forces don't necessarily have to have the um, two objects touching or in contact um, in order for the force to have an effect on the objects. So um, for gravity, right, you don't necessarily need to be touching the surface of the earth um, in order to feel gravity's pull downward on you. Okay, so these are at a distance forces. They don't require the two objects to be touching. Okay, contact forces on the other hand, require that the two objects are touching or in contact with each other, okay? So some contact forces are applied force, normal force, also known as uh, support force, uh, buoyancy, keeps boats and planes up in um, a gas or a liquid, um, tension force, or also known as spring force, and friction. So all of these forces are contact forces. It requires the two objects to be touching. Okay, um, I put strong and weak nuclear forces somewhere in the middle here because it's such that uh, those kind of forces are happening at such a microscopic scale, a really, really small scale. Um, that means that it only appears when some atomic particles are closer together. So um, that's addressed more in physical science matter, and we'll save those two um, for more chemistry classes in the future, I'm sure. Okay, so I want to just step back and talk about all forces here for a second. Um, all forces are measured in newtons. Here's Sir Isaac Newton, and um, he was responsible for, yes, the universal law of gravitation as we found out last week. Um, but what does it mean to be measured in newtons? Well, one newton is the measurement it takes to accelerate a mass of one kilogram, so this object or a box, one kilogram um, of mass, an acceleration of one meter per second squared. So a Newton is backed by this idea that it's, it, it takes one kilogram, one meter per second, uh, one meter per second squared to move. That is equal to one Newton of force. Okay, so a force by definition is a push or a pull on the object. Um, 
and forces are symbolized by the letter F and a subscript denoting the type of force. For example, F of G is the force due to gravity. So you see this notation a lot. Physicists and scientists use this notation that symbolizes the force as a letter F, and then where the force is coming from gets this little subscript, like F of G for force due to gravity. Okay, um, the last point here says, the interaction of forces determines an object's motion, meaning the combination of all the forces on an object will cause it to move or not to move. Okay, so all the forces interacting cause the object either to move or not to move. And then I put fig newtons on here because I usually would hand out you some kind of newtons um, when we talk about forces, but do not be confused that fig newtons are much different than a newton of force newton. Okay, at a distance forces. Gravity. We learned a little bit about gravity last week. We learned about um, Newton's gravity law that two masses um, uh, and their uh, distance um, determines the force due to gravity. Um, Earth pulls objects down near its, uh, near its surface towards its center down. Gravity acts when an object is near a planet or any other mass. Um, objects on Earth, in fact, fall at the same rate when there's no air friction or ignoring air friction. And we figured out that this rate was the acceleration due to gravity, or g, equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, so that means that an object falls 9.8 meters per second faster every second until it hits the ground or it reaches its terminal velocity. Um, I liked this clip art image, even though the person looked a little bit weird here. Um, zero meters per second, and then it drops down one second, and it is 9.8 meters per second faster. Then if you would do 9.8 times two, you get 19.6 meters per second. So after two seconds, it's falling this much faster. Every time you're adding on 9.8 meters per second of speed, because the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, so that's um, something that's going to be coming up. Um, I think you got quiz on it last week. And then also it's something to remember for this. You gotta remember that this number, G equals 9.8 meters per second. Really important number when you're talking about gravity on Earth. Okay, magnetism. Um, certain elements have magnetic properties. Magnets have north and south poles. Um, the science behind magnetism is that same poles repel each other while opposite poles attract each other. Um, for a fun fact, the Earth is a magnet and this causes auroras. And you can go ahead and watch this. I will provide these slides for you if you're interested in how the Earth is a magnet and how that causes auras from the sun. Okay, talking about electrostatic force now. Um, all objects have charges, usually in equal numbers. We can rub charges off an object and onto another object. So the classic demonstration here is the balloon rubbing on your hair. Um, when you have two kinds of charges, positive and negative, the same charges repel and opposite charges um, attract, that's to say. I'll change that before we could put it on live. Um, but anyways, you get some electrons fall off onto um, one of the objects, so one of them becomes more uh, positively or negatively charged, and then it causes this uh, electrostatic force that will pull your hair towards the balloon. Um, electrostatic force is also created in these two types of scientific devices. Um, this is called a Wimshurst machine. Uh, the Wimshurst machine is cool because of these two rotating disks that you crank and um, the interaction between the small brushes and the plastic on the disk causes an electrostatic force. And when you put these two metal probes close together, you can actually see a spark go in between these two. Um, we have one of these at school. This is one of the demonstrations that I wish that you could do. Um, there is a video on it on your jacket document so you can watch it. Okay. Um, another popular one for electrostatic force is the Van de Graaff machine. Um, these are ones that are uh, negatively charged on the surface of the dome here and then when people touch it they become also electri uh, electrically charged. Um, it's important that your feet are on the ground so they don't get shocked and it passes the charge along, so it causes her hair to stand up there. Okay, so that's electrostatic force. Um, now that's all the added distance forces we're gonna talk about. Um, we're gonna talk about some more specifics on contact forces next. So an applied force is a push or a pull on an object. This is the most um, 
basic of the forces. Um, the science means you're trying to move an object. It deforms the atoms. Um, electrons in the atom repel each other, so object keeps its state. Uh, the kinetic energy caused by the applied force causes the object to move. So um, that's the science behind something really basic that happens. Um, what we'd usually do in the classroom is you put your hands on the table and you push it in front of you, that's applying a force. So if you can do that at home, um, or even if you have a book on your desk at home, if you push or pull on the book on your desk at home, um, on the computer, that's applying a force. That's an applied force. Um, fancy word, you get this big F and a little A to denote that it is an applied force, to denote the type of force. Okay. Um, normal force is next. Normal force is a little bit tricky because it's kind of like um, something that happens all the time and we never actually think about how it's working. So I want to talk about normal force as a force that counteracts gravity. So here's my explanation or the science behind it. Um, when an object is sitting still on a surface, gravity is pulling the object down. The object doesn't fall through the surface. But why? The support force, aka the normal force, pushes back on the object, resisting the pull of gravity. The surface is pushed a little bit, causing the surface to resist changing its shape. And as it regains its shape, the surface pushes back on the object. This balances the force due to gravity on the object. So normal force will always push perpendicularly to the um, surface. So if you're thinking about an object, and this is like blue squares, an object on a green surface, okay. Um, the object has a weight dragging it down because of the force due to gravity is its weight. Well, if you're thinking about like a, an object on a table, the table is providing the normal force up so the book doesn't fall through the table. If you pile enough books on the table, eventually you might break the table. That would be, that would be exceeding the normal force of the table pushing back up on the weight of the books. That's why the table breaks. Okay, so um, action reaction. We'll talk about more about this because this is like Newton's uh, really related to Newton's third law. Uh, for every force, there's an equal and opposite um, reaction force, and so this is Newton's idea that that's why um, things aren't just falling through um, surfaces or the table. Um, we're not falling through the ground because the ground is providing a support force that keeps us up. All right. Okay, the next one I want to talk about is buoyancy. Buoyancy is the force that causes an object to float in a liquid or a gas. Um, the science buoyancy is the combined effect of all the water um, around the object pushing up on the um, pushing up on the boat, for example. Um, water atoms bond together and push up on the object. So um, I wanted you to do a lab with this if you have all the materials at home, but um, what? I really want you to come out of this knowing is that a boat with a larger surface area has more buoyancy force than a boat with a smaller surface area. Um, so we practice building boats out of aluminum foil in class and we try and see who can build the best boat and hold the most pennies, the most weight. And usually it's the boats with like the largest surface area um, that end up winning because they have the weight evenly distributed on the surface and they're able to hold more pennies that way. Um, also, hot air balloons and helium balloons work the same way with air, so it's not just buoyancy with boats, but um, certain types of balloons are buoyant because um, the hot air is less dense, so they rise because of the buoyancy force of that less dense air being trapped under the balloon. It causes it to lift upwards, um, pushing on the top of the balloon. Okay, tension force or spring force is next. Um, this is a force that occurs in poles, rope strings, wires, rubber bands, musical strings, anything that is stretched. The science materials get stretched and resist stretching due to the strong nuclear forces holding the material together. The resistance of the material to stretch is called tension. So I like to think of my puppies when I talk about tension force and they do this cute thing called the tug of war. These are not my dogs, but this is a good picture of tug of war with dogs. And if one dog is point on one end of the rope and the other dog is pulling on the other end of the rope. The rope is actually experiencing the same force because of the two pulls on either direction um, in the rope. So this is the type of force that occurs in things that are stretched or pulled. Um, another example of this is like a tether ball string, right? The tether ball is pulling down on the 
um, string the end, but the string is pulling back with a tension force on the ball. Okay, um, rubber band's a good example, musical instruments, another good example. And then um, this is a more of a scientific diagram with like some mass being attached to a spring here. And um, you can actually calculate the uh, spring constant or how springy or stretchy something is um, using the distance you pull down um, and the spring constant. And so if you continue on in physics, you can um, calculate the tension force and the spring force um, that way using Hooke's law, I believe it is. Okay, friction, oops. I'm gonna talk about friction force and then types of friction. Okay, friction force. Friction is a force acting when two objects are in contact with each other, and it's a force that works when objects are stopped or moving. All right, so the most uh, uh, obvious example of friction, when you rub your two hands together, you start to feel heat, that is friction. There is still friction that exists when you hold your two hands together like this. This is a different type of friction. We'll get into what that is on the next slide. Um, friction always resists motion. So if you apply a force to an object, like in this picture here, and you have motion in that direction because you pushed on the object that way, friction is always going to work backwards in the opposite direction of motion. So that's really cool about friction because it can change its direction based on the motion of the object. Um, it always resists motion or acts in the opposite direction of motion. Okay. Um, the friction, uh, science behind friction is that friction is a force caused by the interaction of subatomic particles between the surfaces and an object. Some surfaces like plastic and, and lubricants have smoother materials that have low friction causing the object to slide across it. Other surfaces like sandpaper and carpet are rougher materials that have high friction and cause the object to slow down faster. So if you think about this at like a subatomic level, I like this picture a lot. It has a lot of arrows on it. but you're thinking about these two surfaces and they have like grooves or roughness to them depending on the type of surface and those grooves are actually interacting and colliding with each other a lot causing friction um, a smoother surface would have less of these grooves at a subatomic oops sorry. sorry would have less of these grooves at a subatomic level and so they would glide more easily when you have a smoother surface it all comes down to the subatomic um, particles and how they're interacting with each other at a very microscopic level, which is so cool. Um, and then this uh, last picture is a lab, possible lab that you could do. Um, I gave you the directions on the drag and drop activities, but you're um, flinging stacks of coins using a rubber band and measuring the distance you go on different surfaces um, to measure the, um, the, type, uh, the type of surface and the amount of friction. Okay, types of friction. Um, we'll talk about static friction first. Static friction is that type of friction I was talking about between two or more objects that are not moving. So when you put your hands like this and they're not moving, then you can still feel that they have some like push or pull um, between them because you have to kind of push your hands to get started. That's called static friction. Is when, when the two objects are in contact like that and they're not moving, okay? Once you start moving, it's a different kind of friction. That's what you call sliding friction, especially between your hands. Because sliding friction is friction between two or more objects that are moving in contact that are flat surfaces. So this is, uh, this is sliding friction, or like a book on a table, like moving back and forth is sliding friction. Okay? Um, rolling friction, on the other hand, is friction between a round object, like a ball, a tire, a wheel, and a surface. So here's a good example of rolling friction. Like think about like a soda pop can or something rolling. And the reason it's rolling is due to the friction on the object. Um, without friction, actually objects would have a much harder time being able to roll like they do on the ground, okay? Um, fluid friction. Fluid friction is friction on an object in a liquid or gas. Um, we talked about air resistance last week with our, um, uh, feather and bowling ball um, activity lab and a lot of you pointed out that with the air resistance or the fluid friction from the feathers they were actually falling a lot slower than the bowling ball um, because of the air resistance on the feathers um, 
they were falling slower because this is a force due to friction. Once they got rid of the air, the frictional force was gone, and so you could see that the bowling ball and the feathers fell exactly at the same time. In the vacuum chamber, that's what happened. Without air, um, objects fall with the acceleration due to gravity of 9.8 meters per second squared. And that's just, that just blows my mind right there. Um, so air resistance is a big deal um, when you're talking about falling objects. Also, it's a big deal for swimmers or people um, or, you know, activities in the water, um, such as swimming. Um, swimming. Swimmers want to decrease their drag to increase their speed. So friction can be useful to you and it can be harmful to you. Um, you can use friction to your advantage if you're a parachuter because the parachuter wants drag for a slower descent. Um, the reason you build a bigger parachute with a larger surface area is to increase the drag so you don't fall so fast to the ground and get hurt. Um, so friction can be a good thing and friction can sometimes be a bad thing. It would be a bad thing for a swimmer who wants to go fast. That's why they take all these measures to um, streamline and make their um, swimming suits so uh, uh, frictionless that they can go faster in the water. So those are the kind of forces that I want you to know about. Um, this is the end of this lecture. Um, I hope that you're thinking about forces in your everyday life. Um, forces really are all around you and they do um, cause or resist motion of all objects. Um, I want to send you on um, this week with um, these good messages of may the force be with you. Um, for those of us that are Star Wars fans, you will appreciate this like I do. Um, and anyways, I hope you have a really good week and um, we will see you next time. Goodbye.